I keep hearing how we can't afford health care as I'm flying around the world looking back at American newspapers. And I say it's kind of interesting because we're ranked by the World Health Organization as having the 37th best system that in the uh, OECD, we pay about double what anybody else pays. So now it costs twice as much. There's 20 OECD countries that are rated higher than we are, or a little more, and they can all afford it. So why are we standing here saying we can't afford it? I know there are changes of habit associated with how you receive quality care based on services, but a very large proportion of the American population does not receive any quality care now, and that is criminal. So, I think this is a very powerful and important theme, particularly to air here in Washington, D.C. And I want to thank uh, our research director, Tom Ferguson, for working with you all and curating the, how do I say, within our organization, the importance of bringing this to the top of the masthead. And to the panelists, again, thank you for being here today and uh, illuminating this enormous challenge. Steve? Rob, thank you very much. I actually think I've got lots of mics here. Um, I have, I'm Steve Clemens, I'm editor at large of The Hill, and for the last nine years I've been at The Atlantic. And at The Atlantic, uh, organized a great number of events, what I call 3D journalism and whatnot, uh, on, many of which have been on healthcare. And in the healthcare space, uh, I've seen a lot of debates about the cost of healthcare, uh, how important innovation is, every angle that you could imagine in the healthcare space, except the one we're dealing with today. Uh, and when Ramon Contreras of INET called me and Rob Johnson called and said, would you be willing to moderate it? Um, I largely accepted it because I wanted to learn something new, and I really enjoyed reading uh, the papers, the uh, articles, the American Prospect coverage, uh, the New York Times mentions, which I was very pleased to see um, some of the coverage on uh, the financialization um, <coughs> dimensions of healthcare that I frankly make so much sense now that I've been exposed to the frame, and I'm very glad that all of you are here today uh, to invest some time understanding it because it's very important um, that you go from this room afterward and you begin sharing some of the frames you hear today with this town. I happened to be at AARP uh, with one of the most senior uh, people at AARP yesterday, uh, and I mentioned to her that I was doing this this morning. Um, I said, you guys are very, very focused on cost of health care, too. Had you thought about the notion of what's happening with stock buybacks? Have you looked at the consolidation in the industry? Have you looked at the privatization uh, of parts of the industry that that were resulting in these um, surprise costs uh, that others had, had looked at. And she said, no, frankly, no. And I said, well, I know you're not coming tomorrow, but you better watch it online uh, uh, or, or at least get the video because I said, it, I think it is a hidden, a hidden dimension, but an incredibly important dimension to this. So I'm very pleased. We have a fantastic panel who knows so much more than I do. My job <laughs> is to help facilitate this. We're going to have a conversation, presentation by two uh, of our colleagues. <coughs> we're going to have a conversation amongst all uh, uh, four of us, and then we're going to open to you. And this is an intimate enough room that I hope we can really get into uh, the meat of whatever you'd like to. But we have uh, with me, uh, just to my left, Rosemary Bott is Alice Hansen Cook, Professor of Women and Work, the ILR School at Cornell University. Uh, and she often uh, partners, not all the time, but often partners in, in work, because I've been reading lots of your articles uh, <laughs> over the last two days. Eileen Applebaum is the co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research here, so uh, thank you to both of you. Uh, and then we have William Lazonic. Uh, I've been told I can get away with Bill. So Bill Lazonic is uh, professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Lowell, president of the Academy uh, Industry Research Network, and so many other uh, roles and titles. Um, I was interested in his, his uh, 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 role at the University of Ljubljana University, I may be saying it wrong, uh, where he's done a lot of work with owner Tulum, who's to my far left, a postdoctoral research associate uh, at SOAS at the University of London, senior researcher uh, with the Academy Industry Research Network. So we have a cool crowd who really knows this subject. And one of the things that I'm thrilled by today, and I, and I guess it's a lament I have, is frequently I moderate forums with journalists, media people, you know, folks that come in with the most vapid understanding of the issues they're talking about. These folks really do know and have done quality research and thinking. So it's a pleasure to be what, with all of you. So Eileen, I think you're going to kick us off uh, sure, for a few minutes on your that. sort of research and thoughts. Uh, and then we're going to go with Bill, and then we'll have a conversation. So Eileen? OK, great. So I'm going to be talking about private equity in healthcare. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to begin by telling you what private equity is. I don't want to assume that people either do or don't know. This will be a quick overview of private equity. 
So private equity funds are sponsored by a private equity firm that goes out and recruits people with money, actually uh, usually institutions like pension funds, foundations, endowments, and very, very wealthy individuals. They recruit them to a private equity fund, uh, and uh, then the, the private equity fund goes out and buys companies. Uh, the private equity firm forms a committee. We call it the general partner, but it is a committee of people who work for the private equity firm. It'll be some partners. It'll be somebody who knows something about the industry. Uh, this is how the money flows to the private equity firm. It flows by way of the general partner. The general partner makes all of the decisions, what they're going to invest in, how much that they're going to put on the companies. The investors, the private equity investors that I just mentioned, these are called limited partners. They have no say. And even if they're invested, it turns out they're invested in the, in the Remington, which killed all the, the guns that killed all those kids uh, in Sandy Hook, the pension fund could not get out of that, could not force them to sell it, and could not get out of it. So it's a 10-year commitment. You're stuck for the 10 years. You cannot take your money out. And they do with your money whatever they want. Um, Okay, the limited partners pay the general partner a, a, a management fee, which is typically 2% of all the money they committed. Not necessarily the money that's already been invested, but everything they committed. Uh, and so the, the uh, general partner walks away with 20% of whatever that fund is worth over the 10 years. Um, they like these funds to get bigger and bigger <laughs> because the bigger the fund is, the more the management fees are. This is risk-free income to the private equity firm. No matter what else happens, the private equity firm is going to have that money. Uh, the other thing is that when you think about the equity in the fund, the, uh, private, the general partner on behalf of the private equity firm puts in two cents for every dollar the limited partners put in. So they have a 2% stake. Uh, if there are any profits from this fund, they take a 20% share. So that's a nice deal. You get paid, then you have a 2% stake that you put in, and you get 20% of the profits. Uh, there are many, many ways that the private equity firm makes this money back. If they buy uh, established companies, there will be lots of assets that you can mortgage, and that is what they do. Uh, they, put a, they buy these companies with, with a lot of debt. Uh, in the old days, there was 60 or 70% debt. Rose will talk a little bit about how expensive they, these, these target companies are today. 50% debt on the company is still seven or eight times earnings. It's an extremely dangerous level of debt that they put on the companies, which the company has to pay back, not the private equity firm. So, uh, so, so that's how this, uh, this works. When they buy the company, especially if it's a, a, a retail company, they divide it into an operating company and a property company. They separate out the property, and if they want, they can sell the property off and pay off. That would pay all, off all the investors. Mm. And the other thing that they do is the firm has a side contract with the company that it buys that requires the company to pay it money for, for uh, ad, uh, advising them. You wonder what they're doing with the management fees. But anyway, they collect also from the company. The debt is a double-edged sword. It, it greatly uh, expands the earnings or the winnings for the private equity firm, but of course it means that the company and its workers are very much at risk of bankruptcy. Uh, so uh, so the, they're paying these really high prices, makes it very difficult for them to make a profit when they leave, and so what they now are doing is you buy the big firm, you call it a platform, you buy a lot of little competitors for that big firm, and then you put them all, you buy up the little competitors, you get them cheaply, that brings down the average price. The other thing it does is because these companies are small, they fly under the radar. They, they, you don't have to report a company that you buy for less than $90 million uh, to the antitrust regulators. So you can buy, you can buy a, a, a rural hospital or a suburban hospital. You can buy a lot of them and build up a whole uh, network of these, uh, and, the, and the antitrust guys never know about it. Uh, I'm going to just give you two quick examples, one very quick and then one not so quick. Steve will tell me when I run out of time. The first is Hahnemann Hospital. So Which hospital? Hahnemann in Philadelphia. Hahnemann Hospital is a safety net hospital in a neighborhood that was mainly old people and poor people. Uh, and now that neighborhood is gentrifying. It's, it's, it's now prime real, it's on prime real estate. So I won't go into the details of how, how private equity buys hospitals. They've had a lot of experience with it. They don't make any money at it. It's a horrible situation. 
uh, for them. Uh, they've stopped buying them, but in the meantime, uh, they, they've bought hospitals with the idea of running them as hospitals. They've gotten into trouble, sold off the real estate so that they can make, the private equity firm can make back its money. But it wasn't bought with the intent of selling off the real estate. Hahnemann is another story. It's a struggling hospital in a neighborhood that is gentrifying. Its patient population is still poor and old people. A uh, private equity company comes in, buys it, doesn't do a thing for 18 months. 18 months later, it's in worse shape than when they bought it. Oh, we're bankrupt. Well, when they came in, they separated the operating company, the hospital, from the real estate that it stands on. Only the hospital is in bankruptcy, not the real estate. So they lose the hospital. They own the real estate. Prime real estate now, high-end hotels, high-end condos, high-end retail. I don't know what they're going to build there. They're going to make a fortune. And this community no longer has a hospital. So the, 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 the shocking thing about it is that this has never been done before. This is proof of concept. Think of all the cities with gentrifying neighborhoods that have been poor, that have a community hospital that's struggling, that's gentrifying now, and is going to be a prime uh, asset for some private equity firm. OK, then the other story I want to tell is the one that Rose and I have really been working on the last couple of months. So private equity, it turns out, has gone out and bought up doctor's practices. This was a very fragmented thing. You had little doctor's practices everywhere. They come along and, uh, and uh, buy up the, the, uh, the doctor's practices. Uh, I just want to get the, the order in which I'm going to talk about it. OK, so they, they buy up these uh, doctor's practices. And uh, what, what has been known for a while is that we have a big problem with our, what are called surprise medical bills. It's not that the bill was a surprise. That's not, <laughs> you are an insured person. You have gone to a hospital in your network. You have assumed that all the doctors in that hospital are in your network. But it turns out that that may not be the case. And the hospital may have outsourced its emergency room, its radiologist, its anesthesiologist, its neonatal intensive care unit, its emergency room. I, I said emergency room. But anyway, all things where you don't get to choose your doctor. They take you to an emergency room. Doctor saves your life. You didn't say, are you in my network? You're in a hospital in your network. Uh, you, you have contracted with a surgeon who's in your network. You meet the anesthesiologist at 5.30 in the morning on the day they're going to do surgery. They give you a bunch of papers to sign. Did you read them? Probably not. OK, now that anesthesiologist may not be in your network. And so you will get a separate bill from them. And because they're out of network, they can charge you anything they want. There is no limit on what they can charge you, no cap. So this has been known. This, the, 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 people have complained to Congress. Congress wants to do something about this. Great. They're talking about that they also knew the two big ones are Envision and Team Health. Between those two companies have bought up so many doctor practices that between them, they have 90,000 employees, 90,000, which are in hospitals all over the country. Mm. Uh, so, so there's a good chance you might run into one of them. But, but in any case, this conversation was going on, and people did not realize until I think Rose and I really got the message out there. Envision is owned by KKR. Team Health is owned by Blackstone. These are two of the biggest private equity firms in America. And that is who owns them, and that's who is behind this. So to be, honest, to be clear about it, Envision is the one that has all those surprise medical bills. It's the doctors who are out of network. Team Health has a slightly different model. It says to the insurance company, we'll go out of network unless you pay our doctors way more than you pay any other doctors to be in network. So yeah, they're in network, and they can say, oh, we don't, we're, we're opposed to surprise medical bills. But they need the threat of the surprise medical bills in order to be able to get the reimbursement that they want. And why do they need such high reimbursement? They have put a ton of debt on these companies. Envision has debt. That's why I have this paper, so I don't give you the wrong numbers. Envision's debt due 2025, oh my god, is, you would think I could keep three pieces of paper in order, but I didn't do so good. OK, so Envision has $5.45 billion of debt due in October of 2025, and Team Health has $2.75 billion due in 2024. Well. You know, once, once we made it clear that private equity is behind this uh, and that uh, if you're going to deal with it, you're going to have to deal with private equity. And once it became clear 
that, the, that we have two, we have, we have very good bills to rein in this uh, out, out, outlandish billing by private equity in both the Senate and in the House. Mm. Uh, and uh, at, at the time the bills were introduced, although they're quite good, they would have capped what the out-of-network uh, cost could be. Uh, the industry was just lobbying to get an amendment in there that said, oh, we could go to arbitration if we don't like what you're paying us, and they figured they would make money that way. Uh, but the, the two things happened. One is the debt markets were not impressed by this, by this amendment, and so their debt has fallen. Uh, uh, by the end of August, it's recovered a little bit now, but by the end of August, it was, it was down to less than 80 cents on the dollar, and that's, that's where distressed debt, that's the, the, the cutoff. They're now, they were distressed by August. Mm. This is a big problem for them. They, uh, the Congress has become aware now that this is private equity behind it. They are uh, subpoenaing, subpoenaing uh, information from the private equity firms. But in the meantime, Blackstone and KKR began a dark money campaign. They spent $28 million to try to make sure that nothing passes. Uh, Rose and I, I think, have been pretty effective in getting out to Congress. This is about private equity. You don't want to bow to this. Uh, and, and I think that the committees in Congress are pretty strong on this. That's who subpoenaed the records. They want to know, OK, what are you doing with all this money? How's it working? Uh, and, and they've asked for really good stuff. Uh, so I think Congress is clear. The bill has stalled, not because the, the committees are afraid or the Congress is not going to vote. Despite their $28 million, it seems to have backfired. Uh, people in Congress don't like being pushed around by private equity spending tons of money. And, and I will tell you, if you've, if you've seen the ads, they're not very good for $28 million. <laughs> you see the ad and you can't actually tell what it is they're complaining about. What would yeah. they like you to do? They are, they are really not well done. So, cause I, because uh, there, there are Congress people who were, the, who were targeted by the ads. And they said, well, nobody has come up to me and said, do something different. People don't seem to understand what you're telling them. Uh, but, it, but in any case, uh, it got stalled because we, in the House we have three committees that have some jurisdiction. One has a really good bill out there. The other two have to say, here's my bill, let's compromise, or they have to say, we're not going to go with this anymore. You, you, you will just run with your bill. So why don't we come back to that bill? Well, I'm just going to say that's go, the yeah, end of okay, this. Great. Uh, yeah. But so, we should come back so that we sure, can we understand can. where that is sure. after we get into the but discussion. At the, but anyway, at the moment, it's not that Congress wouldn't vote for it. It's that there's this right. hang up because the other two committees haven't acted. And now we're into impeachment. They're not likely to act. Super. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, bill. OK. Uh, so first of all, I want to thank INET for holding this event and even more for funding the research and, uh, and particularly Tom Ferguson and Rob Johnson who are here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about pharmaceuticals, uh, which, uh, as you know, are a matter of life and death. And there's some pharmaceutical drugs, such as opioids, that actually can make us die. But fortunately, there are a lot more that can allow us to live. Uh, we don't want them, but we need them. Okay. Pharmaceuticals are expensive. Uh, Americans will spend about $360 billion on uh, pharmaceutical drugs this, uh, this year. It will be about 10% of uh, total na uh, healthcare, national health care expenditures. Um, in the United States, uh, pharmaceutical uh, drug prices are about twice as high as anywhere else in the world. Um, and uh, going back to the uh, early 1980s, uh, we have had a few critics of the industry who have accused uh, the pharmaceutical industry of price gouging. Uh, there's an article uh, uh, in the New York Times in uh, July of 1985, uh, which uh, cited or quoted, really, Henry Waxman, a representative from California, um, uh, for, uh, on the issue of price gouging. I'll, I'll, here, these are all quotes from Waxman in that article, though they'll, they'll sound very current. Gou uh, these, price, these companies are gouging uh, the American public, outrageous price increases, greed on a massive scale, uh, profits uh, at the expense of the sick, the poor, and the elderly. Now, in that very same article, uh, Pharma's response, which would still be their response, is, quote, prices have climbed recently to cover accelerated investment in researching and developing new and better medications to protect Americans. Okay, so the argument uh, then and now is that higher prices result in higher profits that get reinvested in productive capabilities uh, that give uh, us safe and effective medical products. 
And if that were, in fact, the case, these price increases might be justified. At least we could have a conversation of, about that. They would not be uh, perhaps called uh, price gouging. Uh, but uh, in the mid-1980s, uh, pharma companies, including companies like Merck and Pfizer, uh, were increasing the extent to which they used those profits to uh, distribute money to shareholders in the form of dividends and something new in the mid-1980s stock buybacks, which is going to be the main focus of what I'm going to talk about. And there was a new ideology that arose exactly the same time uh, that this was good for the companies and for the economy, the notion of maximizing shareholder value. Okay, but since then, uh, this has gotten worse. Both the price gouging and the distributions to shareholders, they've, uh, they've increased. And uh, for the period 2009-2018, uh, if we take 18 pharma companies in the S&P 500, uh, 500 very large companies in the index, uh, they did uh, over that decade $335 billion in buybacks. That was 57% uh, of, uh, of net income and uh, $87 billion in dividends. That's another 49% of net income. So that easy to add together. It's 106% uh, percent of their net income was going to distribute to shareholders. They did not need the higher drug prices. They were using the high prices to boost stock prices. Okay. At another, uh, uh, if we add those two numbers together, they're $622 billion. That was 14% of the amount, the $544 billion that those companies collectively spent on R&D. So they are actually prioritizing distributions to shareholders over what they <coughs> said they were doing. Uh, if we look at the 25 largest repurchasers by the amount of they repurchased over that decade, uh, there are four pharma companies in there. At number nine, there's Pfizer uh, with 68 billion, that's 6.8 billion per year on buybacks, 114% uh, of net income buybacks and dividends. Number 18 is Amgen, uh, 47 billion buybacks, that's 121% of net income on buybacks and dividends. Number 22, Johnson & Johnson, 45 billion in buybacks, <laughs> that's 95% of net income in buybacks and dividends. And then M uh, Merck at number 24, 41 billion in buybacks, 151% of net income buybacks and dividends. This is why they make profits, this is what they're doing with it. Uh, these stock buybacks are done as open market repurchase and, repurchases and they are nothing but a manipulation of uh, the company's stock price. Uh, they're permitted to do this, and in fact encouraged to do this by a uh, uh, Security Exchange Commission rule, uh, 10B18, which was adopted under the radar in uh, 19, November of 1982, and it gives companies a safe harbor against being charged with manipulation if they, uh, the buybacks they do on any single day are not more than 25% of their average daily trading volume over the previous four weeks. Uh, so if we look at those four companies, we say, what does that allow them to do on any single day without being charged with manipulation and buybacks? Amgen, 127 million, Merck, 185 million, Pfizer, um, 166 million, and J&J, &J, 286 million. And they can do that day after day after day <coughs> trading day. Okay. Uh, they are ideal uh, instruments for insider trading uh, by the CFO, CEC, uh, uh, CEO, CFO, others, and including shareholder activists uh, and hedge fund managers in general who can figure out when the buybacks are done. And we do not know when they're done. The SEC does not know the days on which they're done. And so for basically the last 37 years, I think we're just approaching almost exactly 37 years since the adoption of Rule 10b-18, this insider trading has been going on. Meanwhile, tens of millions of dollars flow into the pockets and, uh, to uh, 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 top executives of these companies, never mind the hedge fund activists who come in and buy the shares, sell the shares. And uh, a largest proportion of this is in the form of stock-based pay, stock options or stock awards, and the realized gains from stock-based pay. So for data we have on the pharma executives over the last decade, it's uh, about 70 to 90 percent of their uh, uh, tens of millions of dollars uh, is, comes from their stock-based pay, and part of that comes uh, from the manipulation, a big part of it, from manipulation of the stock price. Uh, the, uh, meanwhile, we, the people, uh, 
support these companies with our taxpayer dollars to the tune of 30 to 40 billion a year in National Institutes of Health funding. Uh, we give them patent protection, of course. Uh, we give them Orphan Drug uh, Act of 1983, uh, subsidies, marks exclusivities, and all kinds of uh, tax uh, uh, breaks. Um, and also, meanwhile, uh, as owner probably will talk about and his research shows, uh, the less financialized companies, mainly coming from Europe, are taking advantage of what we have here as a, na a, a, a national uh, innovation uh, ecosystem uh, to become leaders in drug development. So they're abuse using the system much more than they're abusing it. Okay, finally, what should be done? Well, we have to put uh, people before profits as a principle of pharma corporate governance, and I should say that's true across the board for American industry. Uh, we have to get companies to retain profits, re reinvest in productive capabilities, in this case in uh, what they say they're doing, uh, researching and developing uh, new drugs. Uh, we have to ban stock buybacks. They should not be allowed. They're a manipulation of the market. There is no reason to allow them. Uh, uh, Senator Tammy Baldwin uh, has a, uh, a bill, it's called the Reward Work Act in Congress, uh, which would ban stock buybacks and put representatives' employees on the boards of all publicly listed companies uh, in the United States. Uh, we have to uh, tie executive pay to innovative performance, uh, not to stock price performance. It had nothing to do with stock price performance. And uh, we should regulate uh, drug prices. There is absolutely no theory that exists that could say that given the, the subsidies, the protections, the, the funding that we give to this industry and the inelasticity of demand for their product, that uh, these prices should not be regulated and how uh, uh, Congress has bought into this uh, since the 1980s, because this is, is not something new, is something we need to uh, ask. And finally, um, there's other proposals. An uh, important one is where uh, pharmaceutical companies do not see it worthwhile to produce, produce essential drugs, um, then we should have a public option um, that, that the government should be engaged, which it can do in researching, developing, distributing pharmaceutical drugs. And I'll just stop by referring people to an excellent study that's just come out by uh, Dana Brown at the Democracy uh, Collaborative called the, uh, the Public Auction, which you can find easily online. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, this terrific uh, layout of, of issues, and we've got uh, two other guests with us, uh, Rosemary Botten, owner. And let me ask you both just to kind of give quick snapshots of what you think the headlines are, uh, the provocations that we should be thinking about in, in addition to your intellectual soulmates you've been working with. So, Rosemary. Um, okay, so what I'd like to do is drill down a little bit into what uh, I mean was uh, talking about in terms of the private equity business model. Um, <coughs> excuse me, and how it works in private equity. Um, she showed that uh, it, uh, in surprise billing, it's led to higher um, cost of care and also displacement of workers in the Hahnemann case. And um, the question is, you know, how do you make money in healthcare, which is a crisis? industry, right? Uh, the costs are going up. And so how do you make outsized returns uh, for your investors in an industry like this? And what the surprise billing shows is that they make outsized returns by outsized billing, hmm. right? Um, but what are some of the other ways? Um, what's particularly important now is we, we have a lot of data on trends. And the um, average uh, a price of the multiples that um, private equity firms are paying in 2018 was 18 times um, the enterprise value or the EBTA of a given enterprise. So that means they, they are paying 18 times the right. value. And, they and this is, by the way, much higher than in other industries where it's more like about 12%. And so how do they figure out how to recoup that, that money? At the same time, um, the average uh, exit rate of these firms from in healthcare is 4.5 years. So they are figuring out how to enter a business, pay outrageous amounts, even in the bubble year they were paying 14 times EBITDA, and now it's up to 18 times EBITDA. How are they going to make outsized returns for their investors in that time? So that's one question that really yeah. needs public debate. A second is, what is the moral question? Why should we allow private investors to be making outsized returns on the backs of sick people? 
That is a fundamentally moral question that goes beyond the economics of the business model. So I want to give you just a couple of uh, additional examples of, of how the model plays out. The, um, and uh, do you want me to keep this? Just a couple of minutes. Just, I'll do a couple of minutes. Um, but basically, private equity targets <coughs> either the lucrative niches in the business, um, uh, cash cows, uh, places where there's completely in inelastic demand, like there's not going to be any bargaining, where they know they're going to get their, their money. So I'll quickly, uh, another example in surprise medical billing is the air transport industry. Um, two of the three major corporations are uh, owned and backed by private equity. And this is a, demand is inelastic. It's surged because a lot of small town hospitals and rural hospitals have closed. It means that when there's an emergency, more people have to be air backed out to center cities. So the demand has exploded in recent years. Um, and um, a GAO study in 2017 said the price for a trip has doubled from 15,000 in, in 2010 to 30,000 in 2014. That was then. Um, so you have these two out of the three of these major corporations are basically have huge market power, monopoly power to control the prices and um, and they're making outsized returns with very, very, very low risk. So I'll stop there. I've got other examples, but then give Omar a chance. Terrific. Owner, let me give you an opportunity. Then. <coughs> sure. Um, what, are your, what are your zingers? OK, so um, I just want to uh, add to uh, the points Bill made um, by simply asking the question, you know, one might just wonder. Like, I'm going to ask know, you to speak a little louder. Uh, one might just wonder where those, uh, where the innovation comes from. So um, and how do drug companies actually manage to get their hands on, on, on innovative products and then you know keep price gouging. And and you know, never mind, you know, the, the question uh, the other question would be, you know, whether or not, you know, it is a sustainable model. So uh, when uh, you talk to drug industry, um, and when they mention about the role of government, it's always a negative connotation. So uh, industry regulates, this high regulation is actually driving the cost of drug development, and then because of that, you know, we have to increase the prices. But you know, ne never mind, you know, the, not to mention of the uh, over $30 billion annually invested by National Institutes of Health, uh, making sure that the basic fundamental research is done uh, within uh, academia. And, and that's where the private equity comes in, you know, so the, uh, with the help of uh, venture capital uh, investment. So those, uh, you know, uh, innovative ideas actually being transferred out of, of, of uh, academia into a private, uh, you know, enterprise and then turns into, a, a, you know, and makes its way to, uh, toward the uh, big pharma. So big pharma over time has, um, you know, shifted its role to become a gatekeeper in a, state, in a sense that so um, no smaller scale biotech firms have the capabilities to actually uh, launch products internationally, sell them. They don't have the infrastructure, so they need big pharma, and big pharma is aware of that. And because of that, they have been externalizing uh, and, and, you know, kind of shifting the risk out of their balance sheet. And then, and, you know, so um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, doing what the you know shareholders expect to do. So just come up with products without actually risking your uh, you know assets in a way that you know we can just keep pump money out of the company. So this model is obviously uh, not sustainable. So um, and it will sustain itself so long as the uh, taxpayers continue subsidizing the. Uh, uh, research and development in, in, in this industry. In a sense, this, this is not fair because the public gets uh, double tax. In a sense that not only we pay twice as much as the other nations, you know, the, the pay for the drugs, but you know we continue uh, investing in the, uh, the science and technology infrastructure in this country to make sure that next generation uh, of uh, drug therapies are there when we need it. So. Uh, in this context, we need to re-evaluate the, uh, the role of big pharma or the role of pharmaceutical industry. To what extent they actually undermine or serve the interests of public. Thank you. So let's kick some of this around. Fascinating conversation. And, um, you know, I am uh, uh, new to this frame. And so I'm going to ask you some naive questions. And right. we'll talk it amongst ourselves and then go out to all of you. Um, when 
The EpiPen controversy broke out, which is a Mylon firm, Mylon, the, one of the largest generics uh, manufacturers in the world, which is now being acquired uh, in part by Pfizer in the Upjohn division of Pfizer. Uh, was out there. I sort of dug into the price issue on EpiPen. Like, who is to blame? Was it the executives? Was it the face of the company? Was there other elements? And, and what I learned, I hadn't thought about the financialization dimensions at all, but I did learn a lot about PBMs, you know, pharmacy benefit managers. I learned a lot about uh, insurance firms and deductibles, and I could, you know, sort of dig in over time on what the real price was. What, 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 the felt price was to consumer and what the real price was in the market. And, and I sort of realized that there were a lot of other, you know, I'm a, I'm a writer, so there are heroes and stories and villains. And I realized that there are a lot of villains in this story. <laughs> and they, it wasn't all just the face of the, uh, this particular pharmaceutical company. Yep. So, so is that another dimension to this that deserves scrutiny, that it's not just the pharma companies that are buying and selling and building debt or the private equity firm, but there are other dimensions in the ecosystem that we need to give uh, attention to as well. Bill? Well, maybe owner can yeah. really talk about the uh, yeah. pricing. Actually, it, it fits perfectly with the title of the event, right? The hidden cost. So it's hidden because there's no transparency whatsoever in terms of how drug prices are set mm -hmm. in, in this country. So there's so many, um, so many parties are actually building on, uh, building on the prices. So. Right. And there's all sort of like confidentiality agreements between the uh, healthcare providers and then the uh, PBMs, between the insurance companies, and sort of between the pharmaceutical companies and the PBMs, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it is hard to get your head around and, and try to figure out, you know, who builds on how much on this uh, premium. And so this lack of transparency is really making it difficult and almost mm. impossible to understand what drives the cost of healthcare in this country. So one thing we need to, un uh, we need to uh, I guess, um, uh, push our uh, you know, uh, uh, regulators to, to, uh, to urge the, uh, uh, the pharmaceutical companies and the other uh, stakeholders in this process is mm. to reveal the information. So, um, and so long as we don't have this uh, transparency, uh, we are not going to be able to understand the real drivers of, uh, you know, healthcare costs in this country. So, um, uh, and then it, it, if you read the testimony of, of uh, Mylan CEO, and you know, um, she just uh, refused to give uh, f figures, but she said that you know the numbers mentioned in the media is not like what we receive or what we get. So uh, pointing the direction on the PBMs, but it's right now uh, you know the blame game. Everybody's pointing on different direction, but you know everybody contributes to the into this process, and um, and of course you know one might wonder what is the role of PBM to what extent they add value. In this. Or, or, or add costs. Yeah. yeah. You know, really, Eileen, you want to jump in? Uh, just, well, two things I wanted to say, and that is uh, next year, Rose and I are going to branch out beyond private equity to look at financialization more generally. So mm. it was just pointed yeah, no. out, it's all over, it's up and down the supply chain. But on the PBMs, they take a percentage. So we have to begin with the drug company right. that sets a price. If the yeah. drug company had set a price that was half where it yeah. was, yeah, PBMs right. would take half of that, but it'd be a lot lower. So yeah. it's a little... I mean, that's the, that's that's the, the argument that Senator Tammy Baldwin, who I've interviewed uh, on yeah. this, said makes exactly the same thing about the transparency provision of at yeah. least listing the cost. And I said, well, why is that important? If they said, look, they still set the price, and if from there they... They kind of go all around. So I, you know, I'm not I'm not informed enough to know whether that's enough or a good step yeah. or not a good step. Um, but she makes the same argument yeah. you do, Bill. Let me just add one more thing to that. So in the case of Mylan, and I, 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 it starts with the companies and, and the price gouging. So Heather Bresch, uh, uh, who's the daughter of Joe Manchin, uh, inserted herself in that company, got a job with that company, and rose up to the top as a price gouger. There's absolutely no doubt, uh, really no expertise in pharmaceuticals, and this is true of other companies as well. Uh, EpiPen, of course, had gone off patent in the, in the late 70s, it, but, but they've been actually buying up and, and destroying other <laughs> companies that, that could offer alternatives, and of course, people, kids are in particular, are completely dependent on it. Uh, her mother has been involved in non-profits, so-called non-profits, getting schools to buy these products. <laughs> Uh, the, the other thing is that her, in, in, in the, when the media, it, you know, outraged about her pay, and this also is a research we've done, which is quite unique. I did it done with a fellow named Matt Hopkins for our INET. Uh, they said she's getting 19. She got 19 million dollars last year. 
Uh, she did not get $19 million the year before. She got $44 million. Uh, the Security Exchange Commission sanctions phony numbers for executive pay that's used by the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and unfortunately also by the AFL-CIO and a lot of other uh, progressive institutes which just have been using what they've been given in the, it's called the summary compensation table and proxy statements. So people have to start using the realized gains of uh, pay. And why is that important? Because the 19 million is based on grant date prices of the options and awards. It doesn't reflect the increase in the stock price. It, what they put in their pocket, and we know what it is, we have the data, is what is, it incentivizes them to do the price gouging. Uh, and, and so the way they're paid through stock options and stock awards is an incentive to do the price gouging. And it's not so much the difference between the 44 million that does damage to, to us. It's the pricing and then it's the buybacks and it's all the other behavior that, that goes along with it. So it's all part of a package. And basically at the top of US corporations, and it's not just pharmaceuticals, we've also written a, on Boeing, it's rotten, it's yeah, just I, rotten to the core. I, I, I respect your views, I should say, in case folks are watching online, because I've interviewed Heather Bresch a dozen times, uh, as well as other CEOs, that I, I respect where you're coming from, just want to make sure that, you, that, that I have uh, uh, not necessarily a different view of how they did it, but when I have it been interested in Heather Bresch, in a different front, was how comparatively she was poorly paid as a woman compared to men in her industry. So we can talk about Prowse ga 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 uh, uh, gouging across the industry, but guys get more. Uh, I just <laughs> okay. want to say, yeah. uh, and I and agree. you know, in in the same you know in the same comparable level. So just want to add that to the mix. That but, but while women, you may have a end up genuine, this genuine you know, a genuine yeah. critique about what her compensation was, yeah. she didn't she didn't do as well as the guys who are doing the similar thing. <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, women in this context do the same as the guys. They act the same as yeah, the Yeah, but, but, yeah. but you know, there is a pay gap. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, in any, yeah, please, Only Rosemary. Yeah, yeah. I, I would just like to respond quickly about the ecosystem because they're, they're in the surprise billing. Um, I, we want to just point out with private equity, there is absolutely no transparency in any contract. And that is a, a really serious problem because you right. never can figure out what the deal is. Um, but in, we do have some knowledge of the, the contract between the private equity firms and the physician practices. And what's important to know is that when the specialty physicians sign a contract to become part of a platform like Envision, they basically have a deal in which they get a certain um, payoff and then they become employees, right? But they retain all the responsibility for medical decisions <coughs> themselves, but they give all the responsibility for billing and administration, et cetera, to the private equity firm. Mm. Now, from their perspective, you, you, might, you might not fault them. It's like, well, this seems efficient. This seems like a reasonable thing to do. And then I'll focus on my medical practice and not all the paperwork. Once they do that, though, that then um, it's the private equity firm that's making all the decisions about the billing. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be careful not to just uh, blame the, the specialty doctors who may have bought into something that they thought was reasonable, not really understanding. So, so there yeah. are kind of uh, unsuspecting. So transparency, um, transparency, just knowing how this all is a huge deal, it sounds like to me. And, and, <laughs> And I'm interested because I don't know if a company like Carlisle is in healthcare. Who are the uh, private equity firms you just pointed to? Uh, Blackstone. Blackstone. So Blackstone. KKR. KKR. You know, Blackstone's and KKR. These are two, you know, brand name big big companies with yep. you know tens of thousands of employees. I'm interested. Are there nobody inside those firms who do these deals who feel? like they need to reconcile their souls with what they've done, who so they, leave and, and can come out and share. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm being somewhat serious as a guy, you know, we're watching whistleblower uh, drama here in Washington. Are there not whistleblowers within these firms who can come out and add a little light into the black box you're describing? So it turns out that, uh, and, and so we've written a book and we worked very hard to make sure the book was balanced. We looked for the good cases. Right. And what we found is that when private equity funds buy small and medium-sized companies, they can't load them up with debt because they don't have, they're small. They don't right. have that much to mortgage. Right. And if they're small or medium-sized, there's probably a lot of modernization that the private equity firm can bring. 
modern IT systems, modern management systems, put people on the board who know how to do national and international marketing. Uh, and we have examples where uh, they actually do as advertised. Uh, in terms of number of deals, most deals are small and medium-sized enterprises. In terms of where the, most of the money flows, it's through the big mega, mega funds. Mm. Mm -hmm. So we did interview a, a guy, who, he was the managing director of a fund in San Francisco, and he actually said, we buy companies, we try to make them succeed. This was just after the financial crisis. I said, that we said, did any of them go bankrupt? One of them did, he said, but we're not forcing it into bankruptcy. We're gonna hold on to it, bring it back to health. If we could just sell it for what we paid for it, mm. that's a, that'll be good enough. So, so they were not gonna abandon a company. They were not, and one of the things he said to me. That so I, this, is a, this is a good player. That's right, and he said, I but know. But I wanna hear from the bad player. I like villains. Well, that's really, <laughs> this is the problem, yeah. the good players, go to small funds that are going to do good. I see. And the ones who were, he said to me, I could be much richer if I work for KKR. He said, but you know what? I'm rich enough. So if it's his attitude, but the, the ones on the inside, right. they're not yeah. going to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh. yeah. Um, yeah, well, it, it's, it's a really important point. And it really, when we do our research on these companies, uh, and in this case, sure. we're talking about the pharmaceutical companies or uh, General Motors or, or Boeing. Uh, we uh, approach it as a uh, really a struggle in a sense or between innovation and financialization. There are lots and lots of people in these companies who uh, want to do innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they might get paid very well, but they might not be willing to do the kind of these kind of uh, predatory practices that, that are being done in these companies. But they don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. So they need to be given a voice. And often they don't know what is going on, or they say, okay, uh, uh, like we, when we're doing the stuff on Boeing, oh, those are the people in Chicago, they're doing the financial stuff, we're the engineers, and the engineers are saying, well, if there was an unsafe plane, that's our fault, uh, and they're letting, letting the, 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 the C-suite off the, the hook. Mm. Uh, uh, but they, uh, it's very hard to be a whistleblower in, right. in, in a business corporation, because you're probably, uh, you know, it's done every once in I'd a while. I'd be fine with off the record sourcing, yeah. you know. But, but there are people, <laughs> and, we, and we talk to people who, who uh, one, are uh, interested in innovation, right. and two, uh, who have um, contacted fairly regularly, just out of the blue, by people who read the research and say, yeah, I wish, you know, our company could work this way and, and would like to change it, uh, but and I, th I think, obviously, educating the public about it, having legislation and debate about these issues, it, it helps to empower those people. And maybe they can become whistleblowers, or, or it's easier for them when, when there's really something that's really unsafe being done, mm. uh, become whistleblowers. Rosemary, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I, I have a little bit different angle, which is that I think that, the, at least the people we've talked to, they really believe they're doing the right thing mm. for the efficiency of the economy that private equity, if it closes um, uh, uh, shops that are a little bit underperforming, that's a good thing. If they're rolling up doctor's practices into larger entities, well, they're creating more efficiencies. And um, they're creating market power at the same time, but they would argue that they're, they're benefiting the economy. And so I think there's a lot of that kind of rationale among <coughs> players that we've talked to that, that don't think they're doing something wrong. Well, I, I, I was gonna ask you that, you know, in a sense, on whether there are cases, uh, uh, I think got into a couple of good cases, you know, what you do in this certain level, but whether there are cases where firms were saved or industries were modernized or industries were invested in. I don't know the health space as much, but I can think of some industries where the argument that a Bain and company or someone came and said, hey, this industry would have died, would have gone to China, would have gone somewhere else, uh, and thus we came to rationalize it, created efficiency, saved it, and guess what, now it's growing and adding things. And, I, and, and you can find cases yeah, like absolutely. that. But in the aggregate, you can also find exactly uh, what you and Bill just described, right, right? which is uh, uh, enormous loads of debt, and, and I think debt in certain ways Works like it works in the U.S. government. It, it squeezes out uh, discretionary spending on things you want to invest right, in. Right. So um, I'm I'm fascinated by the way um, you've laid it out. But I would ask you whether or not there are models. It was one of the questions I was going to ask all of you. As you kind of looked at um, hospitals that have had 
trouble that have been floundering that haven't been high performance, or whether there are any cases where they, you know, where, where I don't know if it's financialization, but if there's some model, some regulatory concept, because I think you're in Washington today, we're in policy land, so the question is, what is the frame that allows you to get to a better sp um, um, space right. without throwing the proverbial baby out with the bathwater? Like, how do you get better outcomes without killing the, the process? Uh, so two things to say here. One is the examples that you give where they buy really a distressed company and turn it around, this is a thin sliver hmm. of private equity investing. We can find good stories there, no doubt about it. Hmm. Okay. These little companies that they figure out how to make them big. Anybody in this town who buys Adel sausages, that's a private equity success story. Which sausage? Adel. Okay. Okay. I'll go check it out. Yeah, they're really good. <laughs> they were developed by a foodie out in San Francisco who yeah. did not know how to market them. Anyway, right. it's a good story. Yeah. Uh, so we, we definitely can find the, the, those kinds of stories. But the other thing that happens, talking about a, 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 when they come in, let's, let's say they take over a company, mm. a, a big company, they make it, they, they give the old CEO a sort of a deal. You do everything we say, we make you rich. Mm. Well, everything we say is cut be benefits, cut wages, downsize, whatever it is. Those CEOs who have a, 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 a commitment to the company as a running uh, enterprise, who have a commitment to their workers, they can't do it. Mm. They, they, they turn over, they, the private equity companies fire about 40% of the initial CEOs in that first year. People who just cannot bring themselves to do what the private equity company is asking them to do. And they replace them. They have what they call a cadre. I felt like it was you know, some other mm. country. We have cadres of CEOs who can come in and run any company because they don't have to know how to run the company. They only have to know how to make money for private equity. And so you look at Toys R Us. They came in, they put a CEO in charge, no experience in retail, and no experience in toys. That's perfect. I would make that person the CEO. Look, eons ago, I'll never forget when the CEO of General Mills came in to run Times Mirror Corporation. At there LA you go. Times. And um, <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but Bill, I mean, I would ask you the same thing. I mean, I know you've thought about the policy dimensions, and INET has invested a lot. How do you get the incentives right? I mean, different stakeholders in a corporation to both take care of the assets, including the workers, deal with the issues of creating an incentive that's not about price gouging, but still make money. Yeah, so first of all, uh, in pharma and in other industries, we know how it's done because it has been done. And, and owner for, who's done hist uh, the sure. histories of Pfizer, Merck, and other companies, seen the days when they were innovative. And mm. basically, they retain and reinvest. This, this was the model. Uh, of U.S. companies, and it still is for the ones that are growing big. And even though they might argue shareholder value, they're probably paying their workers more. Uh, they all still try to avoid taxes. They all try to still try to deny sure. that the government's doing anything. But uh, they could become successful because they produce better products, and we get them at, uh, at, a, at a more competitive price. And that's how they be become competitive globally. And when they do that. Uh, we argue that the real value creators are the, are the, are the workers and the taxpayers, and the shareholders actually pay very, uh, play a very real role as public shareholders because mm -hmm. the role of the stock market is to take money out of companies. It gives liquidity. And so that whole, the whole notion of, of shareholders, public shareholders, investors is a problem. But once that's done, and this is why we're seeing the buyback phenomenon and, and why it occurred when it occurred, there's this huge pot of gold in these companies. And if you can have an ideology that says that belongs to people who actually have very little to do, if anything, uh, to creating that pot of gold, they can grab it. And so the, the value, what, the so-called value creators, the shareholders are actually uh, value extractors. We have a book coming out, which is also based on INET's research called Predatory Value Extraction. So, so let me ask you, I, mean, I don't mean to interrupt, but I want to ask you a question. You just said something that really struck something. And I, and I know I will be charged with uh, supporting socialism. I don't necessarily support this, but why doesn't the public, as you said a minute ago, has supported uh, research, the taxpayer has paid a lot, which has been part of the research base, the partnerships, the ecosystem of R&D and development that was at least part of some of this. Why don't they have ongoing equity that exists in those firms of some sort? Well, there are uh, uh, many, uh, uh, you know, there are people who propose you know, worker ownership, uh, there are 
But not even just worker ownership, taxpayer ownership. Or, or why, tax. You know, why don't you say oh, okay. you're going well, to benefit from this? Actually, why don't we have twenty? You know, a twenty percent. Uh, uh, you know, stash away fund within, and, and, and we may be stuck, you know, that, that fund may be stuck in the position that yeah. Eileen just said, you may have no control over the company, but in other words, you're paying back for the national yeah. uh, research base that you um, benefited like from. That. Yeah. Well, let me actually... Is uh, that a bad idea? Uh, uh, well, it depends uh, uh, how it's done. Okay. So, uh, Ken Jacobson is here, and I... Uh, uh, um, oh, no, and, um, and then Matt Hopkins, another researcher that, uh, who works with me, we've written on what happened with General Motors mm. when, we, when it was bailed out. So first of all, the bailout itself was after doing uh, 20 billion of buybacks that could have been enough money with interest not to have to be bailed out, hypothetically. Mm. But when it was bailed out, uh, it was all worker money and, and taxpayer money. There was no private money at all that got it back in, into operation. Uh, but uh, uh, on the Obama tax force, uh, led uh, by Summers at the top and then uh, Stephen Ratner is uh, running the thing, they had a guy named Harry J. Wilson who they hired because, great, he's a Republican, who insisted that the bailout be done with the gov government taking stock, not debt. Mm. Okay, and as soon as it went public, everybody started talking about government motors. And so our government sold its stock. We lost about, I think it was $11 billion, uh, which if they had held it, uh, we, we would have got, uh, been made whole. If it had been debt, they would have had to actually pay us off uh, before they could do anything else with the money. In 2015, Harry J. Wilson, that same guy, shows up leading the hedge funds. He actually organized the hedge funds to demand a seat on the board of General Motors and $8 billion in buybacks. Uh, General Motors compromised by not giving them a seat on the board by doing five billion, and since then they did another ten billion. Okay, now that is that's the problem. You have to put this all in context. But in that context, actually, we should have had debt because debt would have been senior debt had to be paid off before they could do any buybacks or anything else. That, that. But in other context, yes, you right. might you might want to have the government mm. taking. A, I mean, yeah. In terms of reigning in private equity. Uh, Elizabeth Warren has introduced the bill that she calls Stop Wall Street Looting Act. I don't actually talk about it quite like that when uh. I'm doing the talking, but, but it's, it's actually very well thought out. And what its purpose is, is to align the incentives with the private, of the private equity firms with the things that they say they do mm. to provide. Uh, so if you look at that, at, at that bill, you will see that none of what is done by the smaller uh, private equity funds, investing right. in medium-sized companies that Rose and I write about, would be, all of that could still be done. Right. The biggest piece of it is the idea that you can load so much debt, debt that is many, many times the size of the company's earnings mm -hmm. onto the company, and then you, as, a per, as the organization that loaded that debt onto them, have no responsibility for paying it back. That is the piece that she really goes under. It goes after. Right. So she will, uh, uh, in a very targeted way, it's not getting rid of limited liability in general, right. but in a very targeted way, make the private equity firms uh, jointly responsible for that debt if the company goes under. So and uh, th that, will, that will change the incentives tremendously. Thank you. Um, oh, let me ask you a question, which is, you know, again, to, be, uh, uh, to, to provoke you a little bit and understand how you deal with this. You know, I've, I've spent a lot of time recently looking at CRISPR and gene editing, um, immunotherapy research, uh, uh, HIV resistant treatment, the Truvada uh, treatment. These, these incredible uh, leaps in health possibilities have, have been occurring. And again, um, as, as many of you have said, industry says these wouldn't be possible um, if you change the incentive structure. And so I just wanna, I wanna ask you about something like, like CRISPR and gene editing and about us. how do you, how do you assure in the kind of model we're talking about, your concerns about essentially a ripoff where a lot of the gains and growth in these firms are not going to reinvestment, but they're going to um, you know, executive C-suite CEOs. Uh, how, how do you keep the equation right that, so that those gains that have been being made um, are, are in fact continuing? I mean. You might want to talk about Travato. That's a really good mm -hmm. case. Well, I mean, um, CRISPR is a little bit um, unique. Well, don't 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 get stuck yeah, yeah, with my because yeah, I, mean, no, I, I know the government's yeah, involved because, in that. But, but, it's, but it's you know, the really, bottom line is we yeah. seem to be yeah. 
on the edge of some very, very big yep. health uh, breakthroughs. Mm -hmm. and, and so the argument from pharma is that we get there because of the model that yes. we have. And if you take, um, <coughs> if, if, if you mess with those incentives, you yep. mess with that progress. Yep. So I wanted to, because I see the progress, I see what we're out, out there doing. So how do you, how do you square it? Well, first, by asking the question, how did you get to that point? You know, mm -hmm. so what enables you uh, to actually take, uh, you know, this breakthrough idea into a commercial stage? But I, I just, I just want to mention about one thing. So since the 1980s, actually, the government has uh, various different, uh, you know, uh, uh, regulatory tools to actually intervene and, and demand what the public, uh, uh, you know, has a right to, to have. Like one thing is the, but the Bay Dole Act, and then a couple other follow up, uh, following. So uh, the everything is the Bay Dole Act. Yes, the Bay Dole Act. Well, Bay Dole, you know, essentially, I mean, yep. it created also problems. Yep. Not to get too off of yep. Bay Dole, which yep. enabled universities and academics to become equity yep. participants in research, mm -hmm. and it and it and it is seen as something that re really helped yep. drive a ton more research and investment mm -hmm. and growth. Nonetheless, you had companies come in. Yep. And they would say, like in Alzheimer's research, oh, you can't use your lab rat and expose it. So it really harmed the commons. I mean, yeah, I, re I remember, yeah. I remember yeah, at New yeah. America, I mean, Jennifer Washburn has written a lot about, yeah. you know, the marketization of what yeah. used to be a previous commons of, yeah. of, of sharing. But since then, any attempt to actually intervene with the process of setting prices and bringing to right. commercializing this product, there was this just an attempt to constantly leave government outside of the equation. So uh, let the market handle how this product is going to uh, navigate its way through the, uh, the, through the clinical uh, you know, studies and then to the market. But there is something called March in Rights. And then what it says is that essentially, you know, if uh, the taxpayers subsidize uh, you know, a technology, uh, can serve the public needs or undermine public uh, health needs, right. then the government has a right to march in and take the license and give it to another company. Mm. But since then, no, uh, you know, he was, uh, the director of NIH was asked whether or not NIH ever considered, uh, you know, uh, applying uh, the rule and he said no. I mean, uh, and now uh, there's this debate whether or not marching actually covers the, uh, the pricing, you know, whether or not excessive pricing or price gouging is considered undermining public health. It clearly is, but, you know, there's this, uh, you know, um, uh, NIH and other institutions, public institutions are, you know, ignoring, not, I don't want to say ignoring, maybe just negligent or mm -hmm. uh, not very, uh, you know, uh, eager to actually uh, intervene with the process. And again, so we need to keep in mind, you know, we're, you know, they are actually, uh, you know, fighting against a really huge, uh, you know, effects spinning machine called Big Pharma. I mean, uh, in the 1980s, when uh, when the when the Congress start pressuring the industry and then uh, threaten them with the uh, generic makers coming into market and bringing the prices down. They were really good at you know spinning the table around and just getting more out of it, out of from the process. You know, okay, we'll, we'll agree with the generics coming in and you know uh, bringing the prices down, but in return we want patent extension. So in that time, they managed to actually you know point to a to a scapegoat mm -hmm. and get more out of the process. And nowadays we're talking about the rebates and the PBMs, but not talking about the real issue. <coughs> And then I'm afraid that you know PBMs are going to be the scapegoat this time, and we're not going to deal with the uh, real issue, which is a lack of transparency, and you know a deliberate attempt to leave the role of taxpayer-funded research contributing into this innovative breakthroughs and and public. Although okay, so I, I, I get that. I think they would also be because I mentioned PBMs, but I would also we haven't gotten the insurance firms, which we don't have all we have time to do. But there are other players as well. But I, I, I think the other question I want to ask is, you know, I, there was a PBS uh, show on recently about Lilly's uh, investment in an Alzheimer's drug. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 it frankly is a very moving um, depiction of the researchers, the university folks, the folks that were involved in the trials, uh, and essentially a long process of what, lo what originally looked like a pro promising mm -hmm. uh, Alzheimer's drug uh, proved to be a failure, lost about $3 billion. And so here, I, you know, I've often thought, you know, and I, you know, frankly, 
as I interview everybody in this business, the Heather Bresch and other folks, you know, the, the, the pharmaceutical firms are always out there saying how great they are, what they've yeah. achieved, what they've done. Sometimes it would, it would help their case, I thought, think if the public knew more about their failures. So this is the failures. How does the failure part of the story build in so that if we got to um, a world where many of the equities you care about were, were attained, how do you get the three, $3 billion dollar investment in an Alzheimer's drug that um, fails? Well, I mean, um, a couple of issues with this uh, framing. First, uh, failure is part of a learning process, and we can treat them as an expense. It is a part of the uh, asset building process. So you don't know when you start you know, working on a product, right. and you only know as you fail through the process. Mm -hmm. But uh, with the, you know, ex through the financialization of pharma, what we see is that more and more companies actually opting out of the mm -hmm. research in uh, neurodegenerative and neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer because it's risky. There's more learning needed, mm -hmm. and no one wants to undertake that learning. Recently, Amgen, Biogen drug actually has failed in the later stages. It was considered one of the uh, uh, most significant and most promising advancement in the mm -hmm. treatment of Alzheimer's, and it failed with their Japanese partner. And then, you know, this uh, attempt to, you know, dump all the neurodegenerative disease assets and not deal with the risky, then it just kind of con uh, contradicts with their statement of, we invest in what's, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know facing the uh, public health and then we're innovating, that's why we're charging high prices, then they're not engaging in right. learning, and they expect government... Well, I was reading, I mean, I was reading, I mean, the, the, if I were answering my own question, I would go to Bill's paper on buybacks mm -hmm. and say, look at how much has been buybacks. It's so gargantuan, yep. titanic, uh, and yeah. look at what you could have done with those resources. Yeah, and right? I think there's, there's a few issues of strategy here. So at one level, we should have a national strategy for prioritizing solving diseases. Actually, right. we knew how to, how to, how to do everything, Sure. Uh, on one side, we couldn't afford it. On the other side, we'd have way more people in science and technology than on Wall Street yep, <laughs> if right. we really were funding careers that, that you know, sure. and, and there is a relationship between those two. In, uh, uh, as, as the financialization went right. on, it became less certain, less lucrative, et cetera, to stay in a mm -hmm. science and technology career. Right. So and then there's also the level, at the level of strategy. Uh, uh, do the people who are running these companies even understand uh, what capabilities they have or could have in their companies mm. to potentially succeed? Uh, who are they listening to? Uh, so, the, you know, these are very complex organizations. This is where we come back to this sure. issue of innovation versus financialization. Right. Are, are, you know, once you start looking at these cases, and it, you, it, they're difficult to look at because you have to delve into these companies, right. there is a question of why didn't they succeed and was it because it couldn't succeed mm. or maybe the money was cut short at a point in time when it shouldn't have been cut short, they weren't listening to the right people, et cetera. Right. I'm gonna to go to all the um, audience in just a minute, but I wanna ask, um, whatever you wanted to say, but I'm gonna ask the two of you to talk a little bit about the legislative picture, because you talked about legislation that was, that you thought was a good bill was in out there that dealt yeah. with um, some of these issues. Um, but I also wanna ask you kind of a loaded question, which is what is the literacy of Congress on these issues? Um, Eileen? No, uh, I just, let me just yeah, respond okay, to this yeah. other uh, yeah, sure. uh, issue, and then I'll turn it. This is a little bit um, um, kind of outside the conversation, but I'm always struck by, um, you know, there are many, many incentive structures to create uh, motives for innovation. Right. I mean, we have had innovation in our history for hundreds of years. And the notion that, oh, there's only one way to do it mm -hmm. now, and, and we've got, so I think that it has to be reframed. And the, the case I always use with my students is Corning Glass. So Corning Glass spent 19 years funding its uh, scientists to create fiber op optic cable. Right. Invested years and years and years and years and years, patient capital, the most, one of the most incredible innovations that has transformed mm. transmission in our global economy, right? And it just took one company to be committed using its patient capital. There are many, many incentive structures we can build to create innovation in our economy. Thank you. So I will talk a little bit about Washington and uh, Congress 
which I do think is getting up to speed on these issues. So for the surprise, who are the best? Who are the worst? I don't know who the worst are. I know who the best. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, no. The, so the, the surprise medical bill. This has really uh, bipartisan support. You will be surprised that in the Senate, the bipartisan bill, and it's even better than the one in the House, was introduced by Lamar Alexander, mm. Republican, and uh, okay, Patty Murray is mm. the Democrat. And in the House, it's Frank Pallone is the Democrat, and Greg Walton is the Republican. Also introduced a good bill, but got hit by the lobbyists before we came out with our article oh. that it was private equity. They did compromise. <laughs> they tried to compromise. They, uh, they, they gave the, uh, the doctor's practice. So this is the bill you support, that you think is a good bill? Both of those bills. Yeah, okay. They should come forward, and I, I right. believe they would pass if they mm. ever came forward. And the industry believes they would pass, <coughs> right. because they're spending tons and tons of money. Dark money at first. Rose and I could not identify them publicly, because we didn't really know, but we had the press problems leading right up to them. And by the time the, uh, the New York Times came out, they admitted it was them. It was clear. It was not going to be hard to figure it out. Uh, and so uh, Congress is very much, they thought these are just doctor's practices. That's a, the, it's the, the doctor has saved your life, and the insurance company doesn't want to pay them. Right. That was a winning argument, right? And we changed it to, uh, uh, private equity wants to charge you as much as they can, and it's you, the patient, against private equity. I think that message has made its way uh, pretty well into the Congress. Getting it out to the general public is a little harder. They ran ads during, uh, during the uh, World Series. We, we had a very small grant to do our own publicity with, you know, get stuff out in the American Prospect. Not exactly the same thing, but we definitely reached the Congress. Uh, and then we have, uh, uh, with Elizabeth Warren, with the Stop Wall Street Looting Act, we have a really clear roadmap as to what you could do to rein in this industry, to protect workers, to make them take responsibility for their actions, and none of it would interfere with the really good things that private equity does. One of the things we did in this country is we allowed the banks to consolidate. So we no longer have regional banks that can do due diligence on small and medium-sized companies. Mm. You can't, if you're a small, medium-sized company, it's really hard to go to a bank and get a loan. They go to private equity if they need funds, and that is where private equity can actually do good. It can provide them with finance, it can provide them with people on their board who have business strategy, it can help them with their operations, and that's where, that's where the good examples come from. But you buy a big company that's already established, you're down to financial engineering. You're down to thinking about, how do I take money out of this company? You're not creating value. You're, you're making money without actually creating value. Right. And that's what that bill would Rosemary, did you have thoughts? No, I think, no, and she. Um, she does the political I mean, stuff. Well, uh, no, she's here, here every day uh, with her hand yeah. on the pulse. I, I don't actually do any lobbying. Just to be clear, yeah. I did not help no, write your, that you bill. No, you do public education. That's what we call it. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, I, you yeah. know, I write the article that says why the I wrote the article that says why the uh, Warren bill is a good thing. Right. That's yeah. the kind of thing I do. Bill, do you have any thoughts on the buyback world? Oh one, yeah. One well, question so I have for you on this is that, you know, when you're, when, I don't know, you know, buybacks would be an SEC function, mergers and acquisitions, I guess, would be an antitrust and FTC, yeah. and whether or not, I mean, I don't know the filters they use, but whether or not those are the right regulatory bodies to ask to look at some of the dimensions of public impact, uh, worker impact, and whether or not yeah. that, that those are the right spots to look at. Yeah. Would, you, would you agree? Yeah, so oh, overriding all this is uh, there needs to be a perspective on how you get innovation. And right. as Rose said, it can be done a lot of ways. And the, there's, there's, this is the Institute for New Economic Thinking. On this, the economics profession is totally bankrupt. Right. It actually, it teaches millions of people every year mm. out of those Samuelson-like textbooks that still exist that the most unproductive firm is the foundation of the most efficient economy. Most economists know not the first thing about how a business enterprise operates or of the th things we're talking about. So mm. that's the first thing. So there's an education process. Uh, uh, in the work that we've done on, uh, and it wasn't our objective, but we got listened to by some politicians, uh, that education process has borne some fruit. So uh, Tammy Baldwin's Reward Work Act mm -hmm. uh, is a result of that, and it's right. a well thought out piece of legislation. It's fairly simple. Right. At she's this very point. dedicated on this. And yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and I would say very heroic, heroic mm -hmm. being in a in a state where you know you can go 
far to the right as well. Right. Uh, Under, but I'm sorry. The the and the easy part of that is the buyback part because this rule 10b18 is until now the Rural Work Act has never even been discussed in, mm. in in Congress. It was just something a rule that the SEC after Ronald Reagan got elected and the, captured by the Chicago School, that they just adopted again, and people never heard of it until we started writing about it. Mm. Okay, so that's the first, that, and if you just rescinded that rule, the SEC, it's, it's really on the books of the SEC that this could be manipulation. But those numbers I quoted, they, they would then, if they did those, anything approaching that, they'd mm. have to say, is that manipulation? Okay, the, the other side of it is uh, putting uh, workers on boards, and then you have, uh, Elizabeth Warren's Accountable Capitalism Act, which also uh, is complementary because the Reward Work Act says, uh, uh, says a third of the board members should be representing labor, right. which mirrors what you have for more than 500 employees in, in German companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren's Accountable Capitalism Act said for it's about 1,600 companies with more than a billion revenues, uh, national charter, and they should have 40% uh, right. uh, on the board. Now, uh, there I, I think we need a lot of discussion. It's not so easy, because I'm not so sure uh, that the, the worker representatives be on the board would, not, would have the perspective to, to challenge management on a lot of the, 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 these issues. I'm also not so sure that it should necessarily be worker representatives. I think we really need a trusteeship model mm. where it's recognized that you need to balance a lot of different interests. Uh, in, in running a company, and there's uh, uh, people, at least for things, certain things perhaps that can't be made totally transparent, at least know what's, what's, what the numbers are and, and what the company is doing to, to make the arguments uh, before decisions are, are made or right. as decisions are being made. Thank you. Owner, I just want to ask you, just before I go to the audience, quick, very quick snapshot. You bring uh, as much of an international perspective to this as anyone. Does anyone get it far, far better in solving all the problems you've raised yep. today? Well, I mean, um, our earlier research. Uh, like, is France good or Sweden or Japan? Uh, well, I mean. Is um, anybody perfect in this? Well, I mean, it appears that each country has a different model, uh, but they're all eager to be here in this market. Right, so just so, give yeah. me the A plus. Yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> all right. So, um, uh, I can't say for a country, but for a, com a company, uh, Swiss companies are actually really interesting. So especially this particular one, and they seem to be very innovative. And I was just wondering why this company is uh, better than others. So what, what it differentiates them? It turns out it's the ownership structure. It's the what? The Roach. Roach Pharmaceuticals. Uh -huh. It's just uh, they seem to have a different ownership structure. They have a dual class share system. So uh, family uh, family trust actually controls 50.1% of the shares. Mm. And shareholders hate this company because they're very stingy with their profits. So they don't like to share with shareholders. Does that mean? All right. Okay. So uh, they, don't, uh, sh they don't do buybacks and they do dividends, but very reasonable amount. And they like to reinvest. And so if you compare so the So they're the Houghtons in the case of the Corning case. Yeah, yes. Right. So and uh, when Genentech was the pioneer in the biotech, so but uh, they were one of the first biotech companies to implement the Silicon Valley style startup right. model, but they failed miserably. And you know, so they ended up going with Roach for a partnership because they assumed that Roach among all the other pharma companies could, would be the best to, to understand what they were doing and not waste that capabilities build over time. So um, it's not about the, uh, the institutional environment. Yes, institutional environment definitely matters, uh, whether or not, you know, the, I mean, we looked into the uh, UK case and it seems like UK stock exchange, stock markets are not speculative enough to let those uh, flippos, what we right. call flippos, productless IPOs come into picture. Uh, we look at Japan, they are really eager to learn and they've been, you know, merging uh, Japanese pharma and there's this, uh, you know, urge to like internationalize fast. They're coming here, take over the uh, innovative uh, biotech mm -hmm. companies in the U.S. But again, so uh, it really, um, yeah, yes, they incorporate uh, the uh, national innovation system into their uh, the business model, but uh, it appears that uh, 
outsiders, you know, non-U.S. companies appear to be taking better uh, advantage of the U.S. Uh, science and technology infrastructure, initiative, uh, U.S. innovation ecosystem better than the U.S. companies because they're highly financialized. Thank you. You know, I didn't know about all of you, but I learned a lot more about something I didn't know anything about yeah. until yesterday. Um, so I've gone on a deep dive. So thank you mm -hmm. so much for this. But let's open up for comments and questions. Yes, right up here in front. We've got a microphone coming over to you. We have millions of people watching online. Hello, millions of people. Um, hi. Yes, hi. I, I actually just got a push notification from the New York Times <coughs> with the headline, the lower, to lower cost Trump to force hospitals to reveal price of care. The federal rule would make hospitals list the prices they negotiate with insurers, mm. allowing consumers mm. to seek better deals for care. My question is, is that gonna have any impact on private equities? Uh, dealings and how they make these surprise medical bills. Thank you. And tell us who you are again one more time. Sorry? Tell us who you are and where you're from again. Oh, I'm, I'm Karen Connor. I'm from the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Thank you. Um, Rosemary. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, because uh, the, the insurance contracts are with the hospitals and the out-of-network Providers are not, uh, they're not under contract with those uh, insurers. So I don't think it'll lend any transparency or affect uh, the, uh, the outsourced entities at all. Also, private equity has, the, has stopped buying hospitals in general, Hahnemann being an exception because it's a new way of making money on the real estate, uh, treating it as if it was a retail store and you can just close it. Uh, but we started studying hospitals uh, in private equity in 2003, and uh, they had a little heyday there. 13. Uh, 2013, sorry. No, we, were, we have, well, it doesn't matter. In 2013, we had, they had a little heyday there, uh, and we, we studied them because we said, how do they expect to make money in hospitals? Mm -hmm. And it turns out they couldn't make money in hospitals, so they've gone into, that's why they branched into these other things. And but if you're the, Kai, I mean, if, I mean if, if, if this rule, we know nothing about the rule or the details of the rule, but if you're Kaiser Permanente or Inova uh, in the area or Mount Sinai, and you're now living under this rule, I mean, wouldn't you think you're going to have holy hell if you don't provide some level of transparency, both for those that are covered within your system and not. I mean, I understand the cynicism, but I just also deal in the real world political world. I can't imagine the tidal wave of hate that will come if the uh, hospitals don't provide a, a, a big picture under that rule. So I, I just want to, I, I don't want to bandwagon. I just want to sort of ask, is, you know, I, politically, I don't know how hospitals don't provide that greater transparency if this rule came in, because it's such a huge deal to the public right now. But tell me where I'm wrong, as Rachel Maddow would say. Well, I just, uh, you know, there's been pressure on private equity to be transparent um, for years and years and years. The huge amount of uh, pressure uh, from the California legislature to be transparent right. in their contracts, and they're not. And so if you're talking about private equity, being transparent in their contracts with the hospitals. Mm. Um, I, you know, hospitals may be under pressure. Private equity firms have been known to threaten uh, the limited partners who reveal the, uh, mm. the content of their contracts. So I, mm. I mean, I don't see it happening. Bill? Well, yeah, I, I'll defer to owner on that. Uh, um, on this, this issue, as he knows much more about the, the pricing issues. And well, did you know this was coming down the pike? I knew. <laughs> the, 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 Trump, the new Trump rule? It's well, been on I mean, and off. Uh, he, he proposed some, um, some uh, you know, legislative uh, changes like benchmarking, international benchmarking, right. and then I don't know what's the uh, latest on that, so I don't know even if it's a, there's a prospect of if even you know bring it to uh, uh, the house for debate or any committee, so or uh, just uh, uh, you know ex importing you know uh, you know drugs from neighboring regions and all that, so. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical when it comes to like you know negotiating with uh, you know big pharma when it comes to you know I mean not negotiation but you know uh, we, we look at the history of uh, pharmaceutical mm. policy you know, like since the 1960s you know so uh, and each time they were very successful in like the last minute spinning the table around and then just getting what they want so uh, what's different this time so public seems to be more and more uh, angry. Uh, with the insulin, Definitely. diabetes, yeah. and then cancer treatments, and 
So uh, I mean, maybe a, a public option with a yeah, you know, uh, you know, covering more patients in this country, and being a center for Medicare and Medicaid services, being able to negotiate on prices, might just make some impact. But again, so um, it is it is a uh, tall task and a big battle. And not to be facetious, but to be factual, you know, nest, walking in a straight line and doing today the same thing that he's going to do tomorrow may be different. So, yeah, uh, yeah. 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 yeah, anyway. Uh, yes, sir, right here. I'm uh, Ron Hira from Howard University. Um, there was a recent statement uh, from the Business Roundtable about talking about uh, stakeholder uh, versus shareholder. There's been some discussions around business schools changing the way that they uh, approach things. I wonder to what extent do you think that that's actually going to change behavior. Did you read the BRT report? Did you, uh, don't, don't take the mic away. I mean, because I want to go to the, the, the audience, but did you find the BRT report compelling? Uh, no, not based on the signatories. I mean, almost all of the signatories are uh, offshoring jobs. So I don't, I don't take it all that seriously. I, I'm a bit skeptical. So, um, yes, Bill. Yeah, so I think there's a history to this. Uh, it was a business roundtable was really formed in the late 1970s, really in, res in response to naturism and, and, and the threat of you know, taming the giant corporation. Mm. And so business wanted to be out in front of this and not have themselves be regulated around corporate social responsibility. And so they adopted a stakeholder model at that point. And it was, to some extent, more consistent with the way they were being run, as shareholder value ideology. That mm. point was not something that was being exposed by, by business. They were not laying off masses of people. It really started with Jack Welch in the early 80s and it became permissible to just lay off tens of thousands of people who worked at a company for a long time. Mm. Um, they then changed uh, their tune in 1997. It turns out that was the year that buybacks first surpassed dividends of, as a form of distribution to shareholders. But it was also in the midst of the, the, the internet boom or you know, as it was taking off, not quite in the midst of it yet. But uh, it became share, uh, stock price, everybody was looking at their, their 401ks or you know, their, 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 their savings you know, going up and this was like magic and uh, they felt empowered to say, yeah, we're running the company for shareholders. Uh, they are still running the company for shareholders and we actually have collected the data on the signatories, the US-based signatories of, of the, the, to the business roundtable. Uh, um, um, st recent statement uh, uh, in terms of you know, distribution to shareholders, uh, CEO pay, things like this. We haven't had time to put it all together mm -hmm. in a publication, uh, but uh, they're going to have to change the way they're doing things if they're going to be true to what they say they're doing. By the way, Elizabeth Warren wrote a letter, I'm not sure how they uh, decided who to send it to, to about early October to about 12 of these signatories saying, uh, tell me by uh, October 29th <laughs> what you're going to do about all these, you know, uh, communities, uh, 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 customers, and employees. I don't know if you heard back from anybody. Mm. Uh, why, why did they do it now? I think the Accountable Capitalism Act combined with Elizabeth Warren being a potential uh, Democratic nominee for president has a lot to do with it. I think the other side and of it... And INET. And, I mean, INET's been talking about this for years. Uh, well, yeah, of course, you get the research out there, and it, yeah. it makes a difference. The other side of it, which I d they don't want to talk about, uh, I th there's a handful of shareholder activists, Carl Icahn, Nelson Peltz, uh, Paul Singer, uh, William Ackman, uh, Daniel Loeb, making life uh, miserable for a lot of these executives, even if they are shareholder value oriented. <laughs> They, they, you know, Daniel they, Loeb is they, very shareholder. They, they, yeah. they, they, they are uh, not masters of, 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 right. you know, of the universe in their own companies with mm. these people there. And in our book that's coming out in a couple of weeks, uh, uh, we have an uh, analysis of the corrupt proxy voting system right. that allows uh, an activist to have less than 1% of the shares is going mm. on GE and really tell the company what to do by lining up the proxy votes mm. of the of, uh, the institutional investors, right. the pension funds, and mutual funds, and so uh, we call we 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 call the analysis is basically that the value extracting 
Insiders, enablers, and outsiders. Insiders are the CEOs embracing shareholder value. Uh -huh. Enablers are the pension funds, mutual funds, and the uh, outsiders are these now very powerful, a uh, very small number of uh, activists. Thank so you. I think they'd like, they'd like to see, without talking about it, them being right. brought under control. To Thank you. I want to go here, but I want to make just one quick comment myself on this, because um, you know, I mixed, because I read the report, I, I sort of thought, um, I recently moderated a dinner of chief diversity officers of some of the biggest um, companies in America, Silicon Valley and others, some local here, and, and I asked them, it was a private off-the-record dinner, but I asked them, how many of you are fig leaves and how many of you are real? And it was half and half, and so it was interesting because there were people who obviously knew that their firms were engaged in saying something, doing something that was not even genuinely really dealing with the issue of diversity, you know, gender and racial diversity in their firms, and others were really doing it. So we made it a show and tell night. It was a very emotional, fascinating uh, discussion, but I sort of feel like the same thing with this issue, that I pay a lot of attention to what INET does, but in this kind of growing boot, I am shocked uh, that BRT was willing to even say the things they did, even though I agree with you that I'm not sure they're with you and maybe they're just trying to cover up. But if you see where the public goes in grabbing it more, it's, it's, a it's fundamentally a political question right. uh, and where the currents are going. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they put a placeholder there. So I don't want to say I'm totally cynical. I, I think it's an interesting placeholder. And, and if that current continues to go that way, I imagine BRT will begin filling in more of the detail. If the currents don't go that way and they're not pushed, then I think we can see it as a vapid um, you know, moment. So I just wanted to be fair to your very interesting question. But yes, right here. Hi. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the panel. Uh, I'm thinking the hidden cost of the health care got to be far more than what you are presenting. You are presenting very interesting, very good cases. But I think the most basic things is our system problem, our system <coughs> abuse. So can you address those things? For instance, if an elderly who have had a lot of savings, a lot of investment, suddenly was deprived of, and then sent to a mental hospital, even they are healthy and healthy family, mm -hmm. and destroy the family, and then no job and nothing. Right. So there's a hidden cost, not just employment, not just economic situation, but their family assets, and their uh, abuse of, of the mental hospital or behavior institute, that kind of cause, even they don't have to go to hospital. Right. And eventually the total cost is by taxpayer actually. So right. we are not uh, put this account to the police department, to the government attorneys. Right. This is a really hidden cost. Thank you, thank you. So let me ask, so thank you for that. But what she's really in part talking about people that are victims caught in a process. Um, again, I mentioned being at ARP yesterday and talking about folks that are caught and trapped. <coughs> you talked about people who walk into a hospital uh, and are caught with surprise billing. So uh, let's respond on the question of what can be done and other factors. I mean, this is a, a, a discussion of financialization, but to the degree you have thoughts on how those people who are really victims you know, of this, and, and they, they don't have large voices in the process, what yeah. can be done? At the moment, they have no legal standing. That's really the problem. So the insurance companies can charge whatever they want. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the uh, mental hospitals or the uh, agencies are owned by private equity. A lot of nursing homes are owned by private equity. They set a standard, and then the others match it in terms of price and so on. It's, you do end up really bankrupt at the end of all of this. Uh, and. Uh, the idea, so you talked about the transparencies of hospitals. Let's make all of that transparent. These are not marketplaces. Hmm. You make the prices transparent, it doesn't really matter. Hmm. You're sick, you have to go to a hospital. I think I was enough. reading uh, something you both wrote about non-elastic demand exactly. and how folks are ripped exactly. off. Exactly. Right, so, so in, in a great market, American Prospect article, right? Was that where it was? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, so the, the point that he's making is that in a market, if prices go up, you can consume less of it or you can go to a competitor. But in these markets, they're not really markets because you, you're taken to an emergency room and you're not gonna bargain over the price. You're, you know, you're, you're, you're in one of these homes, you're not gonna bargain over the price. You have no real control. This one first. Yes, right back here. Hi. 
Uh, yeah, I just uh, that was a good lead into one of my other questions. You guys have talked about taking out the abuse of everything. I think that's a definitely a good uh, program to get into as well, for sure. But uh, speak a little bit more to over, you know, taking more efforts in the supply side of things, maybe direct investment into uh, government research and development and making that more open source uh, education programs for medical professionals. Um, Right. Uh, you know, even infrastructure to right. that point. And, and, and tell us who you are. Uh, my name is Jodan Wilson from Amarillo, Texas. Great, thank you. Right. Uh, thoughts? Well, this is a, a great theme of the, uh, the center that I work for, uh, that, it, that, it, that the education should uh, be available, either low cost or free, that the government sure. should take, it already does, as Bill has pointed out, and uh, 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 all of the basic research, there's no mm. reason that these things should not be open source. Uh, so that has been the position at the Center for Economic and Policy Research for a long time. Rosemary, do you have thought? I, no, no I'll, I'll pass on this. You'll one. pass on that one, Bill? Yeah, well, <clears throat> talk about the hidden costs of health. Uh, the victims, uh, from the, the type of research we do more generally, and when we even abstracting from particular industries, are workers who have been with a company 10 years, 20 years, 30 right. years, all kinds of experience, all kinds of human capital, very valuable not just to them, but to us. And they are let go. It becomes very difficult to get another job. Uh, their skills atrophy, and nobody knows about it. Right. Uh, and uh, there are ways of dealing this, uh, with this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, during the last uh, election campaign, I haven't heard this time, Bernie Sanders was talking about Denmark. People like talking about Denmark. Well, Denmark has a flex security system. Mm. Uh, you know whoever is being laid off, and uh, it's not hard for companies to lay people off, but the skills are maintained. They, they link that with what they call a lifelong learning system. It's very expensive, however. It's a, it costs a lot of money to, uh, to, to, to keep, keep people's skills up to date. If, but it also means that if we were to do that, uh, people would be more aware of what business is not doing and asking the question, why are you laying these people off? And often the people are laid off who are people who actually are could be potentially valuable to those firms, except for the fact that the top executives have decided, no, uh, we're not going to invest in, in these new technologies. I mean, everybody should be looking at Apple, and I, uh, unfortunately, I can't abandon a, a bank, uh, you know, uh, uh, my Apple products. But Apple has done $288 billion in buybacks since 2013. It's not just what Tim Cook is thinking, because after all, he's a supply chain guy. He never had any vision of a new product. He had a vision of how to outsource to China. But what is Al Gore doing? Mm. He, sitting on the board of Apple since 2003, a very small board, and not saying, why aren't we using this money differently? Or has he ever said that? And Apple could, with that money, Apple could have done Massive amounts of money. The other thing, if it hadn't paid out that 288 billion, let's say it was just sitting on its mm -hmm. books, it would not be wasted to the economy because it would be put into uh, government bonds, corporate bonds. It would be available uh, to other companies uh, as a supply of capital. Right, right. You know, so we have to look at that whole system. One last thing, since we were talking about debt, I don't want to let this go by uh, before. Uh, we're, we just done a little article on uh, debt finance buybacks. <laughs> In booms, about a third of the buybacks a company yeah. doing are financed by debt. You know, so it's a double whammy. You know, it's it's it's, it's crazy. It's so weird. Um, uh, Rosemary. So I wanted to respond to this uh, question um, and just thinking about the supply side and in terms of workers. One of the things I've been struck by is in the debates around healthcare reform, the focus is on patient care, which is of course appropriate, but there's there's little discussion about workers. And the, what our research really shows is the quality of care is linked intensely to the quality of the jobs and the quality of the skills of the workforce. And so if we want to upgrade mm. the healthcare system overall, we need to link the quality of care to the quality of the workforce. So that means government funding to invest in skills, training, careers, Absolutely. and healthcare. And what's really important, we've done a, a, a major piece on the overall system of, of looking at workers. So w wages have been stagnant or f declined in healthcare for the last, since 2005. Now, this is the sector that is also growing the fastest, mm -hmm. where there's the most demand, where jobs kept growing during the recession, and yet wages are stagnant, and there are no career paths. So 
if you, for example, come in as a worker, there are very few ways to go from being a nurse's aide or a tech up to the next level, the next level. That, that's criminal. They're, these are people who self-select into an industry where they mm -hmm. really care right. about uh, taking care of patients. And a, 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 a reform that really understands the linkages right. between workers <clears throat> and patients. Mm -hmm. All of our research is showing the linkages and that people on the front line are the most important people in determining the quality of care. Thank you. Owner? All right. So I just want to make, uh, make a point. I'm, uh, treating healthcare as a privilege and turn it into a commodity that can be bought and sold is problematic in and itself. Mm -hmm. Like, so from the supply side, the, what drives supply is actually the price, the pricing mechanism, right? So, and if you look at the market today, that what actually, um, the ways in which companies actually deploy their resources is actually where the price is increasing or where the profit margin is higher. So that creates another inequality in itself. Right? So no one, people are just really nervous, anxious about cancer, whether or not I'm gonna die from cancer, but no one bothers to ask the question, what if a complex virus, mm. bacterial virus hits the public? Do we have enough arsen I mean, uh, drugs in our arsenal to treat those complex bacterial infection? So no pharmaceutical company wants to get into this uh, with antibiotic business because, you know, Certainly, the existing uh, you know uh, structure, market structure is not going to help. You know, you you can't make money if you can't sell drug, and if you sell too much antibiotic, you're going to build resistance, and that's not going to work. It's going to defeat the purpose. Because pharma doesn't want to get into right. this business, no researcher gets funding. And then, if you look at the NIH, you mentioned about very great things. You know, can we just diversify that you know allocation of those resources, public dollars, to younger researchers? But unfortunately, there is a problem in that uh, front as well. So uh, younger, young researchers don't tend to get uh, grants. So they tend to end up being postdoc forever. And then right. certain regions, certain uh, you know, physicians, certain researchers tend to get those money. And usually what determines their research agenda is what, where the profit lies in the market. Right. right. I want to go to the gentleman. And I'll go to you, and we're going to wrap it up. But I want to say, uh, in response to your interesting question, again, to add another chapter to the financialization conversation. So when Rob Johnson wants to do another one of these, um, I've talked <coughs> to a lot of CEOs about their employees and training. And there's an interesting uh, fork in the road that they come to when they want new skills, or they need new skills for whatever X uh, target they have to do. And they have a choice. Do they upskill and train and invest in the workers they have, which goes to your point, or do they let those people go to, exactly as Bill described, um, and go acquire or buy another firm, which adds to the financialization debt, the, you know, the dimensions of everything we're talking about. Um, in my book, the ones that are doing a public service are the ones who are investing in their employees and finding a way to create lifetime learning and continual education and creating nimble credentialing systems are, are performing a public good but not getting credit for it. It's moral and ethically uh, validating um, if, if anyone knows that they're doing it. Yeah. But it, there is a, there's a problem where there is no penalty uh, for them or reward either way they go. Well, guess what? But that's yeah. what innovation requires. Yeah. It's yeah. not, you know, and, and you end up having a higher wage bill and you add, right. when you're on an in, doing right. innovation, you end up having more profits because, yeah. because your workers are more productive, you have competitive products. Exactly. So you need the, the, those experienced workers. No, totally. And I think yeah. it's a very interesting question and thank you for it. Yes, sir. Love every one of you, good panels. Um, especially Eileen. I am from Philadelphia. My mom has to... You're uh, going to give me a short form question, I, I hope. Yes. Um, you know, I mean, like, you're talking about drugs right now. Um, this just came last month. Viscreenin, with Vincristin, it's a chemotherapy drug. It's $20. We are in shortage of it. Another version of it from Pfizer is $200,000. They're available all the time right now. Kids are dying. That's one of them. Second of them, uh, are you talking about innovations? Innovi innovation means nothing if it cannot be delivered to the patients. And the patient does not get to choose often the decisions made by providers. 
here's one of my challenges in here that I want to mention is that uh, we spend over $100 billion of unnecessary testing in the United States. And so I want you to come to a question because we're right near the end of the program. I wanted mm -hmm. to include you, but I need a question. How are you going to incorporate in innovations if they can really save American money, and how do you get it to the hands of patients? Great. Thank you. Thoughts? Well, um, I just, that's a great point. So uh, we actually had a really lively discussion with uh, Tarek Amen from IMAC. And, you know, a physician on the field, especially those who are every day, you know, dealing with patients, uh, they don't want to call most of those drugs actually available out there as innovative drugs. So um, from Bill's perspective, innovation means improving quality of a uh, product quality while right. Uh, reducing the cost of acquisition, mm -hmm. right? So from this framework, I don't know if you can call many of those drugs actually innovative because not only they are, maybe they are just making this incremental in, uh, you know, changes to health, mm -hmm. but at a higher cost. So I don't think in my book it should be called innovation anyways. So mm -hmm. it is just, uh, just, and, uh, it's just price gouging and, and it's, uh, it's, and as so long as this uh, incentive structure is there, I think it's a perverse incentive that just doesn't actually push companies to innovate, really come up with uh, better products at a lower cost to actually defeat the competition. So uh, if you want to get to innovation, you've got to change the incentive structure. Eileen? There was, I think, one more question. Oh, no, I could, but you look like you were about to jump at your seat on this question. No, no, no. Okay, great. Yes, hi. Hi, Afton Sissel with Congressman Doggett's office. Right. I wanted to talk to you a bit about... Is your congressman good on this stuff or terrible? He's what, you're talking about all of his favorite issues. Oh, he's good. wonderful good. on this stuff. And yeah. I've talked with Eileen about the private equity issue. And I wanted to talk a little bit about their business model of buying up a lot of the small competitors and right. consolidation here. Do you think there's an, a missed opportunity related to antitrust enforcement here? Yes. And right. are you aware of any yes. investigations that are going on right now and a greater interest in using antitrust law to yes tackle some yes. of this? Exactly. Thank so, you for raising Yeah, that's great. And nice to meet you. Uh, the the uh, FTC actually has the ability to do something about this. The, the, there are these small buy-ups. They have the ability to do a look back. They're just not doing it. Uh, you certainly have uh, people on the FTC at the moment who care about this a lot and who are uh, accumulating cases. Sometimes I send them emails, <laughs> but they're accumulating cases where this is happening so that uh, should we have the Democrats in the majority, you can't be sure the FTC is going to do its job even then. I can't say that it did in the past, but at least you have uh, some people at the FTC who will want to push for that. So yes, they buy these small companies, they fly under the radar, but if you could do a look back and say what they're, they're building national power. And the other thing is they don't only fly under the radar. If we look mm -hmm. at the private equity companies, if we look at the in, uh, Envision and Team Health, they made some very large purchases, mergers with companies, and those were approved. Those were approved mm -hmm. by the FTC with virtually, in, in one case, no penalty, no, you didn't have to do anything, and in, an, in another case, we built the largest for-profit hospital chain by number of hospitals. And we, when, when that big merger took place, they had to divest two hospitals. Right. They ended up with 130. So the FTC can do a lot. It just needs to be motivated to do it. Bill? Um, yeah, well, I think there's a, a tremendous amount that the, the agencies can do if the people inside are informed. So uh, it's finding, the, you know, getting those people in, mm. inside the agencies and, and, and having discussions with them. And I'm pretty new to that, to tell you the mm. truth. And, uh, uh, but I'm finding, you know, that when you do have someone who's receptive, it, it can make right. a big Owner. difference. I'll just defer. <laughs> I won't add anything to what Close, Bill said. Good. We're kind uh, Rosemary? Of this area. So, you know, what I would say uh, in, in closing, I, mean, I, I love this discussion. I also think that there's opportunity in the FTC, but as a person who's semi literate uh, in these issues or, or perhaps on the border of illiteracy, nonetheless, I can tell you after looking at the public interest provisions and some of the filters they use, what would be extremely beneficial. I mean, I just <coughs> listened, Bill, very carefully to what you said about contending ownership structures or equity structures for public interest. I was fascinated in the 45 seconds you said that because, whoa, I hadn't thought of that before, uh, or the different things. And what you have in these public is, is just total blurriness. 
And so what you don't get, and this is where I'm critical of what I would call the social justice side of economic governance, um, it can't all be heart, it can't all be sentiment, it has to be specificity that's laid out in the structure. You know, Rob Johnson worked on the Hill, he knows this, that you've gotta be able to translate this into replicable and understandable strategies and structures that are going to be resilient over time if you're going mm -hmm. to affect this. And it's been my one friendly criticism of some folks who, not you, but of others in this space, is it just remains so blurry and vague that we talk about an aspiration but not talk about the track to get there. But I think we made an awful lot of progress with that today. Uh, I'd like to, so first, thank, thank all of you. Uh, Rosemary Batt, thank you. Eileen Applebaum, Bill Laz Lazonic, and Owner Tulum, thank you so much for this uh, conversation. Congratulations to INET, and thank you all very much for joining us.